Good morning, welcome to NBC. Uh, if you're joining us online, we also welcome you as well. And uh, we are gonna be in Acts chapter 11, so go ahead and have uh, your Bibles, Bible apps, all that good stuff ready to roll this morning. Um, we're starting a new series, and for me, that's thrilling. I absolutely love starting a new series, and so this is going to be a journey through the second half of Acts, okay? Now, we, when we, when we were uh, kind of getting ourselves ready to come into this building, we did a couple of things. One was we tried to prepare ourselves so, uh, for events like this today, right? And I'm so proud that so far at least, you may be thinking it, but you haven't said it yet, so I'm very happy about that. Um, you haven't said uh, something like, um, the fair is in my parking spot or something like that. Uh, part of why we wanted to come here was for occasions like this. There are a thousand churches around us that would kill to have a situation like this. I'm thrilled that it's here, and I hope you are too. So by all means, take a chance. Go hang out down there. If you're wearing NBC gear, be nice, all right? Um, and if you're going to be mean, put on somebody else's gear. Uh, put on the uh, manual faith's gear or something. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Uh, we love those folks over there. So um, anyways, just uh, hope that by the time this day is uh, finished, you're going to feel emboldened and empowered. You're going to feel like... God has equipped you to be a missionary, okay? And, um, you know, when you're looking at Acts, it's a little tricky as a preacher because I remember when I was younger, I used to think Acts was kind of the boring part of the Bible. Um, I would read through the Gospels, were fine, but then I would get to Acts, and it felt like all of a sudden I was reading about a bunch of nameless, faceless people and what seemed like history to me. And so it came across, you know, like when you're a kid, and you find out, hey, it's going to be a field trip day at school, so you're really excited. And then they tell you that you're going to a museum. And you're kind of like, oh, that's, no. I'd rather be in school almost than go to a museum. I, don't, I was hoping for a ball game or a, a play or, or something with a little action to it. A museum's boring. All that stuff you know, goes on in the past. That's not really my kind of thing. And so Acts, I think, can come across that way to people who don't understand that really as part of the church, this really is our story. It's, it's not like going to Thanksgiving and having your grandmother uh, sit you down and to say, now, 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 sweetie, I want to tell you about your great, 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 great uncle Luigi who came over here in, in uh, 18 aught whatever, and where you kind of roll your eyes as a kid and you don't care, but when you get older, you actually care. You realize that what, what happens in history, sometimes we're doomed to repeat it if we're not careful of its bad history, and if it's God's redemptive history, then we can draw great encouragement from that. And so I hope that that's the spirit in which we're going to do this. We're going to, we're going to get on a, a ship and sail with Paul to some of these different missionary journeys, and we're going to start kind of at the church where it all began after Jerusalem. So I'm going to take you back where we were when we... Um, when we were at 355 Grand, just down the street, and then we heard about some little virus or something that was coming around. So we, we hit pause on that series, and we never pressed play again. So we're going to press play right now. We ended there with the stoning of Stephen. Stephen was a deacon in the church, a real firebrand. This guy would say anything to anybody if he thought it was true. He was called full of the Holy Spirit. He was one of the deacons there in the church at Jerusalem. And, you know, he's one of those guys that's just really helpful to have around. He's one of those guys, he's kind of the, uh, uh, the junkyard dog of, of uh, theology back then. So well, he would go out and, and if the Pharisees or the leaders of the time, if they were having a, a problem of some sort, uh, they, Stephen would come out and he would say what needed to be said. So that would allow some of the others maybe to not say it or say it differently. But Stephen was the guy who would always say what he thought needed to be said, and he would often say it in a way uh, that didn't particularly go down that smoothly, okay? So, so much so, in fact, that he was stoned to death in Acts chapter 6. So there are a couple of phrases that come up in the book of Acts repeatedly. One is full of the Holy Spirit. And when you hear that, that phrase means they're full of the Holy Spirit, but it also can mean either they're going to get themselves in trouble, that's what's about to happen, and or it can just mean that they're about to go on and do something very courageous. But it really is the sign, the moniker of a person of courage, okay? Or, or a situation where God shows up and imbues courage, all right? Uh, the other is that um, the Lord was with them, okay? That phrase right there is usually a sign that they're about to win a victory, okay? 
Uh, it's not, they're not about to take an L, they're about to win something, okay? Those, these both pop up. And it's important, again, I'm kind of painting the picture for you. So Stephen dies in Acts 6. I want to go back to Acts 1. Acts 1 verse 8, Jesus says this to them. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and the ends of the earth. Okay? So the idea is, hey, I'm going to be with the Father. Your job then is to go. All right? Well, by the time you get to Acts 6, they still haven't gone anywhere. By the time Stephen dies, they're still in Jerusalem. They're still kind of doing, uh, they're doing good things, but they're doing it there. They haven't left anywhere. All right? So in Acts 6, Stephen is put to death, and what ends up happening is now people are scared. In Acts 4, there's some persecution that goes on, but they're all, they all kind of huddle together, and they pray, and God, it says, sends the Holy Spirit into the room, and they stand up, and they speak the Word of God with boldness. Not this time. This time, somebody actually died, and this time, they're scared. So you scatter. So, it's not the way you draw it up on paper. Uh, you'd hope that somebody doesn't have to die for people to do what they're supposed to do, but, but that's the net impact of what happens here. Um, we recognize from the Great Commission, Matthew 28, where he says to go make disciples of all nations, and we see it here in Acts 1, 8. You're going to go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. God cares about everyone everywhere. God loves every person, every city, and he works all the time in all these various places. This series in the book of Acts is about how God works to make that reality come to life, how it goes from the empty tomb to Jesus' ascension, from that to the church then going and spreading out and doing God's work in the world. Until Acts you know, 6, 7, right in there, they are still kind of huddled together in Jerusalem, okay? But here's what happens after the death of Stephen. This is Acts chapter 11, verses 19 to 26. Here's what we read. Now, those who were scattered because of the persecution that arose over Stephen, okay, traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, speaking the word to no one except Jews. Now, now let me pause there for a second. So now, they're still not doing what they were asked to do. They're just taking their inward focus mobile. All right? So they're supposed to be going preaching to everybody, but they're not. For the most part, they're saying, I'm going to go find other Jews in Greece or in wherever we land, and I'll talk to them. All right? So there you go. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists also, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. And when he came and he saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with steadfast purpose, for he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and faith. And a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Saul, And when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. And get this, and in Antioch the disciples were first called Christians. All right, review. Church is told to be witnesses. They don't do it. They're witness to each other and other people there in Jerusalem, but they don't go beyond Jerusalem. Acts 6 or so, Stephen is put to death. Everybody's freaked out. Everybody starts running for the hills. But they run into the hills, some of them land at a place called Antioch, and they go, hey, let's go find other Jews, and we'll preach to them here in Antioch. Still not really what they're supposed to do, but they go ahead and they do it. But there are a couple of guys that say, you know what, I don't understand why we can't preach to everybody. So they go ahead, they get outside the bubble, and they start talking to other people. They come to the Lord. Well, word gets back to Jerusalem, way back over here, like in Acts 1, uh, hey, guess what? You aren't going to believe this. They're preaching to people who aren't even Jewish. And so Barnabas Packs up, he goes out to Antioch to see for himself what's going on. He sees it, and he's like, this is great. There are people who aren't even Jews that believe in Jesus. And so he sends word back there, and then he says, you know who else would get a kick out of this? Saul. Paul, as we know him. Let's go get him and bring him here to Antioch. So then you've got Barnabas, you've got Paul, 
And then you eventually, we know from other places that you're going to have Peter there. So they got Barnabas, Paul, and Peter. That's pretty good. You can build a church on those dudes. They're good. They spend a whole year there at Antioch with these people. Now you might think, and that's by the way, where we first are called Christians. Probably not as a compliment, by the way. Probably not Christians among themselves calling each other that. It's probably a little bit of a uh, religious slur of sorts. That's all right, we'll take it because it's got Jesus' name in it. But that's where we're first called Christians. And so now you have this church that's booming, made up of Jews and Greeks. You got Barnabas, you got Paul, you got Peter. And all of a sudden, they're loaded. I mean, this church is, is, is loaded with firepower. Now, why is it here that the gospel seems to really take its root and go forward? I wish I could tell you that it's basically a second Jerusalem. It's actually about as far from that as you can get. In fact, the historian, uh, the Roman historian Renan, he puts it this way. He refers to Antioch as the city of the gladiatorial games of dance, of courts, and of bacchanalia. By the way, that's bad. All right, Bacchanalia, that's all the Bacchian stuff, eating and drinking and sleeping with people and all sorts of whatever. Think about a big old bash that you'd have in something like Rome. Bacchanalia, okay? That's what that means. Bacchanalia. So if you find out your teens uh, have been involved in any Bacchanalia, go get, get your hands on them, all right? An unheard medley of charlatans, criers at the fair, traitors, jesters, enchanters, wizards, swindler priests, ballerinas, Heroes of the arena and stage. Uh, one scholar says Antioch was famous for its chariot racing and for its deliberate pursuit of pleasure. Las Vegas on the Orontes River. Antioch was most famous, of course, for its worship of Daphne. If you've ever been to Daphne's restaurant, it's named after the goddess Daphne. You may remember her from the Cupid story. Let's go review our Greek mythology briefly. Cupid, Apollo, Daphne, Apollo and Cupid. Kind of got a thing going. Cupid goes, boom, shoots him with the arrow, sticks in Apollo. Oh, no. Now he's hopelessly attracted to Daphne. So he pursues her and pursues her to no avail to the point that she's finally about to be kind of, I guess I'll use the term, apprehended by him. She prays to Zeus, and who turns her into a laurel tree. So she goes, poof, all of a sudden, it's a tree. She's a tree. So... Um, there's the, the story of Daphne. They have a temple to Daphne. And that little story I just told you was acted out live night and day in Antioch. Cupid, Apollo, Daphne. So you got Vegas on the Orontes. You've got this picture. It's almost Parisian, kind of early 1900s, uh, turn of the century kind of kind of time, wild, all sorts of crazy stuff going on. The, the Roman Juvenal was his name. He actually was going after Rome. He was, he was targeting Rome, and as an insult, he says, we got this way when the Orontes River, that's a reference to Antioch, when the Orontes flowed into our city, flooding the city with wickedness. He's saying, you drank their water. That's the problem. So now we're as wicked as they are. So what he's saying, is, now isn't it odd that you go from Jerusalem, right? That makes sense. If you're going to build a kingdom, as, 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 if you're going to build something like that, I've never built one, but if I was, I'd probably go to Jerusalem. I wouldn't go to Antioch. But then circumstances, they were charged to go. They didn't go. So then God goaded them. He dispersed them. All right, if you're not going to go, here you go. And it's there they land at Antioch, and just there, it goes kaboom. I mean, they, they end up with the greatest preachers. In the first century, it's Barnabas and Paul and Peter. Second century, you have Ignatius and Theophilus. In the third and the fourth, you get Lucian, Theodore, Chrysostom, Theodoret. Hmm. All right. Let's... What are we supposed to get out of this? Why is that in here? Is it really just a, hey, sit down, let me tell you about your Uncle Luigi kind of thing? Is that where, why it's here? I think there's more than that here. So let me give you a few things for us to think about. And by the way, everything we're going to talk about with regards to the church is true of a human being as well. So feel free to hold up the mirror or 
the looking glass. Either one works today. We should really do both because I think it's here for both reasons. Uh, let's start here. God's always working everywhere, always. One of the things about this text that strikes you is that the little church that couldn't can because it says God's with them, right? So when God is with people, and this, this, by the way, goes all the way back to the very beginnings of Scripture. Moses goes to Pharaoh. Well, who should I say sent me? Just tell them I sent you. I am sent you. Oh, okay, I'll tell him that. And Pharaoh's not impressed, but he is by the end. The presence of God, God being with them or not with them. When Samson, the story of Samson happens and he gives up his secret of his great strength and he goes ahead and decides that he's going to be fine without his hair after all. In a really tragic line, it says of Samson, he did not know that the Lord had left him. And so he thinks he's still going to be strong, but he's not. Why? Because his strength didn't come from his hair. It came from this covenant with God, which his hair represented. So when that covenant was broken, now his strength is gone. The church now is starting to learn that it's not just about technique. It's not about <laughs> have great music or have whatever. It's like, by all means, have those things. It, that the church is spirit dependent. Spirit dependent. Barnabas, full of the Holy Spirit. The Lord was with them, right? It's the presence of God that, that takes them where God wants them to go, that actually keeps them from being afraid the way that they were. Now, it's not that God, did, they didn't have the Holy Spirit before. It's not transactional like that. It's, you know, it's not like, uh, you know, pregnancy or something like that. You are or you're not. It's not that. It's sometimes in degrees. You can quench the Spirit. There's this full of the Holy Spirit. You kind of get the sense that there's measures to some of this stuff. And the Spirit is working. We're told that in Acts 4. The Spirit comes in. They get up. They speak the Word of God with boldness. And then after that, you have uh, situations like, like this where it seems like, um, you know, uh, you have Stephen full of the Holy Spirit. He gets stoned to death. And then here, full of the Holy Spirit. God is with them. Listen to what happens next. This is Acts 11, 27 to 30. This is what a spirit-filled church looks like too. Now in these days, prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. So now prophets are showing up to Antioch. One of them named Agabus stood up and foretold by the Spirit, there he is again, Holy Spirit, that there would be a great famine over all the world. This took place in the days of Claudius. So the disciples determined, everyone according to his ability, to send relief to the brothers living in Judea. And they did so, sending it to the elders by the hand of Barnabas and Saul. So here you have the Holy Spirit showing up again, this time on the, uh, you know, working through the, a prophet who says, hey, there's about to be a big famine in the land. So guess what happens next? These brand new Christians go, well, we should help them. And they pass the hat. And now they're sending money to Judea. They're sending it back here to the people who wouldn't go. They're taking the money, and now these folks at Antioch are sending it back to them. What would it have been like to be at the church at Jerusalem and get a check from the people at Antioch? Would you go, wait, we're supposed to be sending them money. What are they doing sending us money? Well, what they were doing was being obedient and submissive to the Holy Spirit's prompting, Right? So let me suggest something to you. Your length of time in the faith can be a great asset to you if you remain submitted to the Holy Spirit. But one of the things that's fairly striking here is that at Antioch, what you see and what seems to be making them as effective as they are is that they are submitted fully to the Holy Spirit, whereas at Jerusalem, they kind of have one eyebrow in the air. It's one of those deals. Well, somebody needs to go over to Antioch and make sure that everybody who's becoming a Christian is supposed to be. We know from elsewhere, that'll become an issue that sets the table eventually for the book of Galatians, circumcision. Okay, great, you're Christians now. Now just go be circumcised and you'll really be Christians. Paul says, nope. It's the gospel, period. And it's there at Antioch that Peter will infamously 
uh, be eating with Paul and everybody. And then when these people from Jerusalem show up, he says, oh, I don't know these guys. I don't eat with them because I'm a Jew. And Paul calls him out for that in the book of Galatians. It is better to be submitted to the Spirit and new in the faith than to have been in the faith a long time and lose your submission to the Spirit. It is way more important to have the Holy Spirit active and working in your life than it is to have length of tooth in the faith. Now, there's nothing saying that just because you've been in the faith a long time that you don't have it. I mean, good grief. Uh, I would never say that, something like that. But boy, you want to marry that. Part of what makes, gives Christianity its power is not experience. It's not like being a welder or, or something. It's driven by and empowered by the Holy Spirit. Full stop. That is what it means to be a Christian. That is what Jesus is talking about when he says, it's good that I should go, for until I go, you can't receive the Holy Spirit. So he actually is saying to them, having the Holy Spirit within you is greater than having me walking among you. Okay, that's massive. So here in Acts, what's going on is the Spirit is breaking out in every way, shape, and form at Antioch, and the people in Jerusalem don't know what to do about it. But it's a good reminder to us that God works in all sorts of places. One of the best things you can do for your faith is buy a plane ticket and get on a plane and go somewhere else and watch the church in action somewhere else. It's incredible what you see. That's one of the things we're going to do throughout this series. We're going to tell stories from overseas in other countries, marry it to our own story here at New Vintage and see examples of these things as we go. But the Spirit here in Acts 11 gives this prophet knowledge of the famine and gives the Spirit the Spirit gives prompting to the believers to give their support to their brothers and sisters in Judea. It's an acknowledgement by the newcomers that they are family with the insiders. Furthermore, it's obedience to the Spirit. Number two, God often uses difficulty to spread the gospel. They probably didn't see it happening this way. This is probably not the way they wanted to do it, uh, but it's what happened nonetheless. Persecution breaks out because Stephen and his death forces them to scatter. Okay? It might be worth thinking about whatever challenges you're going through in your life. And instead of viewing it necessarily as a witness against God's existence or something, instead taking a posture of anticipation, thinking, I don't know how God's going to use this, but I know he's going to. So I'm going to walk through this boldly. It's what happens here. If you were alive back at the time and you had watched this happen, there probably must have been, how could God let this happen to Stephen? I know he says he's with us. If he's with us, then why is this happening? Right? Well, what ends up happening is not that God wanted Stephen to die, but he takes that and he uses that to spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. It'll be interesting, I think, we'll look back on the era we're living in, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and we'll be able to see the hand of God. If you can't see it yet, we will see it. I believe we will see the hand of God uh, doing, having, looking back and going, you know what? I didn't see it then, but I see it now. I see how God used this. Just like Joseph is able to look back on what his brothers tried to do and says, you know what? You intended it for evil, but God intended it for good. So you can take that and you can look at the church, you can look at the country, you can look at your, yourself in the mirror. Okay, but that attitude, we don't always see right up front exactly how persecution or trial or difficulty, uh, how that's going to manifest the, the, the work of God in the world. But as Romans 8 says, you know, God is going to work things together for those who serve him and are called according to his purpose. And so for those of us who are, are in this room that are from Christ or, or with Christ, that, that's, a, that's something that we can lean on when things seem to be awful or we don't understand what's going on, that it causes us to have the patience to say, okay, I trust God enough that I'm going to wait and see how he's going to do this. I'll give you uh, an example from uh, Great Britain in, in uh, 1927. Young fellow named T.S. Eliot, good writer, poet, won the Nobel Prize in the 40s, I think it was, 1927. Yankees won the World Series that year, I believe. Greatest baseball team ever built, in my opinion, but I digress. T.S. Eliot becomes a Christian. Now, there was a little writer's guild in London at the time. They were called the Bloomsbury Group. It was like this little, little enclave of all the stud writers of the era. And when he becomes a Christian, 
this becomes a problem. There's another writer in there by the name of Virginia Woolf, some of you would have heard of. She is not happy. Here's what she writes to another member of the group about Eliot's conversion. I have had the most shameful and distressing interview with dear Tom Eliot, who may be called dead to us all from this day forward. He has become a believer in God and in immortality, and he goes to church. I was shocked. A corpse would seem more credible than he is to me now. I mean, there's something obscene in a living person sitting by the fire and believing in God. And so this little enclave turns on Eliot. So at the time, be pretty, you know, God, I became a Christian and now look how my career has turned backward. Look at how now I once enjoyed the favor of all the people and now I'm, uh, uh, you know, a complete uh, you know, mockery to the, my peers. I thought this was supposed to bring you glory. How can I bring you glory if I'm called, you know, uh, a corpse is more credible than I am? Well, what ends up happening is because, especially at that time, writing was such a big deal, the, the fact that he had become a Christian stayed in the headlines in part because of people like Virginia Woolf griping about it all the time. So what it ends up doing is it spreads. It's not like today where you can just tweet something out. That stuff took time to, to spread, and it took a, a real energy source to spread that kind of news. But even if it's negative news, the news that Elliot's become a Christian starts to make its way out of London and all the way around. And so some years later, when other authors, some guy named C.S. Lewis, and everybody else decides they're going to convert, it's now not unheard of. They're not as afraid. Now, is that how you draw it up? No. But listen to Eliot as he talks about persecution. This is T.S. Eliot in a poem he wrote. He says, it is hard for those who have never known persecution and who have never known a Christian to believe these tales of Christian persecution it is hard for those who live near a bank to doubt the security of their money. It is hard for those who live near a police station to believe in the triumph of violence. Do you think that the faith has conquered the world and that lions no longer need keepers? Do you need to be told that whatever has been can still be? Do you need to be told even such modest attainments as you boast of in the way of, uh, as you boast of in the way of polite society? Why should men love the church, he asks. Why should they love her laws? She tells them of life and death and of all they would forget. She is tender where they would be hard and hard where they would like to be soft. She, she's talking about the church, tells them of evil and sin and other unpleasant facts. They constantly try to escape from the darkness outside and within by dreaming of systems so perfect that no one will even need to be good. But the man that is will shadow the man that pretends to be. And the Son of Man is crucified always. And there shall be martyrs and saints. And if blood of the martyrs is to flow on the steps, we must first build the steps. If the temple is to be cast down, we must first build the temple. He says, yeah, I understand, as he's talking about persecution, that it's hard. If you live next to a police station, to understand that uh, violence is a problem. Yeah, it's hard to think that your money could go like that if you live right next door to a bank in a very wealthy society and you've never seen anything like that. And that's his way of saying people don't understand persecution because they don't know any Christians, <laughs> really. And he says, but that is the crux of Christianity. Persecution is the pulse. That, that drives so much of of, of what makes Christianity tick is the willingness to testify to who Jesus is, even if it means very uh, staunch and rough criticism. Ask Stephen. Ask Stephen. Ask Paul, who lost his head. Ask, well, some of you in this room even know what it's like, because when you became a Christian, your family treated you differently. 
They used to take you seriously, now they don't. Your professors took you seriously, now they don't. Your friends, they thought you were logical, now they don't. Okay, lean on the words of the church and history and people who've gone before us that have suffered far greater than we have for the faith. Because God used their difficulties back then to get them to do what He'd actually called them to do. And I believe by faith that we will look back on the times in which we live now and we will look back and we will see how God used this era to get the church to do something awesome. Three, the church is supposed to go as we grow. Here's Acts 13, 1 to 3, a couple chapters later, still at Antioch. Now, there were in the church at Antioch, this is Acts 13, 1 to 3, prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaean, a, long, a lifelong friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit, there he is again, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. So it's that simple. They're sitting there praying, and the Holy Spirit says to them, hey, Barnabas and Paul, they need, you guys need to send them out of here. I mean, dude. You want us to give up? That's not like giving up, you know, the, 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 the 18th, uh, you know, intern or something in a church. These are like, this is Barnabas and Paul. Guys, you need to send them forth. And they do it. See, the, 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 the mission was not for Antioch to continue to grow and be the biggest church in the, in the Roman Empire. The, the mission is what you see in Matthew 28 and Acts 1.8. It's going, not just growing. As you grow, you go. That's the way that the Scripture aims. That's where the trajectory of the Bible goes. Uh, a couple ways of looking at this. One is uh, those of you who do any fishing or whatever, uh, surface fish, fish that tend to eat up toward the top. So I'm told... Now, I know there's a little debate about this, but I'm told that, you know, uh, surface fish that are kind of up on the top, maybe like a goldfish, something like that, that uh, they only grow to the size of the tank they're in. So if you take a goldfish and you put it in a fish bowl, or you put it in a little small thing, it's only going to grow enough that it can stay healthy inside that bag. Okay? That people are like that. That they have to be given the ability to grow. Barnabas saw, you know, whoever, and you see this in Paul's own ministry with Timothy or whomever, right? You're, you're saying, okay, now we're going to get you to a point where you can, you can go and you can, you're now out preaching the gospel out in the far parts. Barnabas, you need to be going around doing what you do. You encourage people. You go around to every dadgum church you can get in front of and you do what you do. You get up and you encourage those people. You tell them how the Spirit is moving in them that you believe in them. Tell them that I know that their life isn't going great right now, but it's going to get better. You do what the son of encouragement, that's what his name means, that that, you go do that, okay? And Paul, Paul, you'll do absolutely anything uh, to get in front of anybody that you can preach the gospel to. You will, you will jump out of a window. You will, you will get on a boat. You'll be beaten half to death or whatever. We need guys like you instead of wasting all of that here because frankly, a lot of us here are kind of cowards. You're not. Why don't you get up and go do what you do? And you go, you're not afraid, you're a good thinker, okay? You're a philosopher, you're a Pharisee, you're an educated guy. Go do that. Don't, you don't need to stay here with us. We've got it. Holy Spirit has told us to launch you guys, so out you go. <laughs> Parents, okay, your great legacy is going to be who you launch out of your house. Not the pictures you take. How'd your kids launch? Where are they? Who'd they become? Okay, that, that's what you're supposed to be more concerned with as a church. It's not just how we grow here. It's what we do in terms of impacting the area around us. It's not just, okay, let's try and become as big as we can. God doesn't just, he doesn't measure us just by our seating capacity, but by the sending capacity, as they say. So, when I look at this, um, I go back to yard work with my dad in the summer. 
uh, his, his hustle was uh, putting in sprinkler systems for people. And so I was his ditch digger, free child labor back then, you know. Um, it was hot, and the stinking grass and stuff in Long Beach could get really hard. And I'd take my little spade-looking thing or whatever and, and jam it in. It had the edges on the side so you could drive it down with your leg, and I would just dig the ditches, and then he would go lay the pipe, and then I had the box with all the connectors in it, and he would just tell me what he needed, and I'd grab one and toss it to him, all right? Well, you see pictured here on this next slide, uh, these are the basic kinds of connectors, okay? Now, see, we, go, we do T.S. Eliot, and we do yard work here at NBC. We go, we go snotty and blue-collar all at the same time. Bougie or backyard, doesn't matter. We're there. Here we go. Um, so, so these do about what you would think they would do. They channel the water in a particular direction. So you've got the T connector on the top center there, all right? Uh, it's called a T because it looks like a T, hence the name, right? Uh, over here, you have an angle connector because it's on, on, on an angle. You get, you get where this is going? 90 degree angle, 45 degree angle, all right? Uh, then you have this dude, and this is really, this is the dude, okay? This one right here, this is the cross, all right? Now, you're expecting me to make a cheesy analogy. I'm actually just saying it, it moves water four ways. There's nothing to do with the cross of Christ, anything like that. It just moves water four ways. It's shaped like a cross. Then you got caps. If you want to stop the water, you cap it. Now, if you only cap it at one side, here's what happens. The water goes in, and then when it hits there, Guess what happens? It goes back the other way. If you doubt me, try this at home. You go home, you get face to face with a, like a cinder block wall, take a hose and spray it against the wall at face height and see what happens. The water will hit the wall and bounce back, similar to a cap, okay? Now, the other thing you can do is cap it at both ends, in which case there is no water coming in or out, all right? I could take the time to elaborate on all of those pieces and how churches are like each of those pieces. Okay, you've got some that are, you know, they're just capped at both ends. There's zero going into them. Nobody's going out except through the grave. <laughs> okay, they, they just, they're there, they're stagnant. They, they're not allowing any, any freshness in and God isn't using much cap, cap, okay? There's some that are capped so negatively at one side that God's trying to get through, but they can't because they, they aren't allowing, they're not submitted enough to the Holy Spirit that goes boom and they goes back the other way. All right? So they, people take off as fast as they got there or whatever. Then you've got the, the more angular kinds of things where they, you know, their the church is growing or whatever, but they, they're not ready for the cross-shaped one yet that sends water everywhere. They need to kind of, you know, so that elbow there that kind of takes it and sends it one more direction. All right, and then you kind of get to the T-shape where you can kind of, you know, up and maybe out a couple of directions. And then the cross-shaped one is kind of when you have a church that's growing and vibrant and it's out and it's, it's making impacts and how they serve sort of the poor and the city they're in and the area they're in and the world and worldwide. And they're helping, helping all that stuff, right? That those are ways in which God starts working in here. Now, here's where, where I'm going with this, Okay. The more like Antioch in this respect that we're willing to be, the more likely it is that God will send us the Pauls and the Barnabases. But if we cap it at one end and we say, great, anything good that comes in here it stays here because we're going to use it for ourselves. I mean, think about what an odd blasphemy it would be for Antioch to be a church that did not do everything that it could to, exp to have the gospel preached beyond it. It was the one that no God couldn't get anybody to show up and preach there. So now if somebody does, they come to Christ, and now they won't do it. That would be upsetting to God, I think. But they don't. Their hands are open. They're writing checks back to Jerusalem. They're sending Paul off. They're sending Barnabas off. They're doing all this stuff, and they're not doing it afraid. You know what I love about freshly baptized people, like the ones we got from last week? Dude, they are unstoppable. I could tell them to be quiet. They won't. They will not. You can't stop them from preaching. You can't stop them from telling people how great God's done something in their life. You can't do that. 
You know, you, you have to be in the faith a while to have all that joy sucked out of you, right? You see what I'm saying? That, that what you need is you need the Antiochs of the world to kind of give it the fire, and you need the stability of Jerusalem to help teach them more about Jesus so they don't get pulled off. We know that was a problem in the early church. If you read all of Acts, there's heresy everywhere. Things start getting really messy really fast. We'll talk about that next week. And so you need Jerusalem. You need the mature people. But you also, man, you need Antioch. You need those churches that are willing to send, that have their hands open say, and ready to share. You know what? We got money. Let me, let me here. They need help. We should help them. Pass the bucket. Let's, let's help those people. Those are our sisters and brothers, and they're about to go hungry. We can't have that. Right? That, that kind of energy, whereas Jerusalem is still kind of stuck. They're kind of got a connector where, you know, it's like, okay, Stephen just died. We're afraid. Antioch's not afraid. So at this moment in time, they need each other. Sisters and brothers, this is not a time in the world we're living in where churches need to be isolated from each other. This is a time where God's people need to be sharing with each other, leaning on each other, sharing with one another, lending each other one another's strengths. That, that, sisters and brothers, is how you have the cross-shaped kind of connector where the Holy Spirit is coming in and it's going boom, 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 out of every stinking, you know, uh, artery of the church. That's what pleases God. God doesn't run out of Holy Spirit. He does sometimes run out of connectors in his human vessels like us. But, I mean, think about like, uh, you know, parable of the talents. You know, the people who are willing to take what God has given them and make more, they get more. The person who buries it in the mattress because they're afraid, I'm afraid because you're a harsh man, he says. Great, wicked, lazy servant. Take what he has and give it to those guys. And that's what happens. Guys, think about the opportunity that lies before us and how we can honor God together. And let's embrace the truth that God is likely to send us the heroes that we are prepared to make. And no more. We, we'd like our leadership pipeline to look like this cross-shaped joiner, sending things in, in all directions. And, you know... Fear um, is best overcome by experience. So those of us who are a little older in the faith, I've been in the church my whole life. I've watched God do miracles before my very eyes. When my daughter, little daughter Nora over here, she was, I don't know, eight, nine years old. We were in Las Vegas uh, praying for the city. And uh, <laughs> no, we were actually passing through uh, on our way to Utah at the time. We were in there. We stopped at New York, New York. We were going to go on the roller coaster there. And so we got a chance to go. And it's one of those where the roller coaster car takes off from inside the hotel. So you're like, you go down these stairs, you wind around through a video arcade, and there's, you sit in the car. But all you can see is the thing take off, and then you hear screams of terror, right? So it sounds like the people are dying, all right? So she has every right to be afraid. Now, this is a legit roller coaster. Like, it has multiple loops and corkscrews and things like that. So it's not like a little kid roller coaster. I mean, it's a legit roller coaster. But we were at that age where it's like, okay, she can barely make the height requirement. And, and we're at that phase where it's like we got two kids that are a lot older than, than she is. So it's kind of like, okay, if not, then who's going to stay off the roller coaster to watch her? And so we had to try to get her on this thing. She was not having it. She was not having it. And so I became her personal fear coach at that moment. And we began to work. I tried logic. I tried to say, now, Nora, I'm here. I'm alive. I've been on roller coasters before. If you're going to die, then why am I still here? Whew, didn't matter. Um, you know, I tried every little piece of logic I could find. And, and eventually I realized this is not about logic. It's not about persuasion. It's really just about I've got to find a way to get this kid to get on this thing through bribery, through whatever it takes. Well, one way, shape, or form, I did get her on there. Okay, and we were sitting next to each other. She was not in a good mood. Um, and when this thing takes off, right, we go up the check, 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 check thing, drop in, first thing out of the chute was a, was a loop. Well, once we go up and down the loop, and she realizes after she does the loop one that she's alive. 
Okay, from that moment on, for the rest of that ride, you know, she was having a great time. And now, if you go to an amusement park with Nora, she is an unstoppable force. Like, she will go on every ride that's there to the point that, that my wife and I cannot keep up with her. Because now she knows, you know what? Those things are built to actually kind of keep people safe. And you know what? Uh, they're really fun if you can get going 80 miles an hour and doing loops and corkscrews and everything like that. And she's still got a young neck and young joints, so she can do that all the time. Whereas the rest of us old people are, you know, brittle in our old age. <laughs> Can't do that, right? But what, what I'm saying is, guys, guys that's kind of how you have to do it. I don't know how to help convince you. I, don't, I can read scripture to you, whatever, but at some point, I need you. I'm begging you, you got to get on the ride, and you got to go, all right? Get on the ride. Let's go. Yeah, no, there's no time. I mean, look outside the doors. How much time do you think we got? How much time should we waste? How much more time should we waste? Okay. My money's on none. I think God wouldn't want us to waste another minute. I don't think he wants us, and he doesn't want you, sisters and brothers, to waste your life. See, it's not just about the church. It's about the people in the church, too, and how the Spirit works. Stop being afraid and get on the ride. And I promise you, look, we're all still here. We're still here. And the good news of the Scripture is to live is Christ, to die is gain. That is the blessing of the gospel. We should live our lives as people and as the church on mission every day. We are both senders, and we are the sent. So, I got to stop. Get on the ride, all right? God is inviting you, and there's plenty of room on this ride, and off we go. And it leads, it leads to a great place. And the stories that you hear in the Bible, you have the chance to be a part of that. You know, they're not like nursery rhymes. It's not the three little pigs here or something that might happen, or, oh, that's a great story. Stuff happened. That famine in, during the time of Claudius took place uh, that was mentioned there in Acts. And that's our story. It's not your great, 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 great Uncle Luigi. These are our people. These are our family. And so let us be inspired by their example. We're going to take the Lord's Supper now uh, with bread and cup. We will um, celebrate and we'll say yes to Jesus and to the call. Uh, we do this every week here at NBC. If you didn't get the elements when you came in, you can go ahead and raise your hand, and we have some ushers walking around with it. We have my daughters down here in the front and apparently came late. So, uh, And there's a second one right here, Mavini Corley, is, is, was late too, apparently. So, And Ricky Rodriguez. Man, what is this? You all are supposed to be leaders in this church. You all, I'm just kidding. Uh, and Mark, oh, Marco, say it ain't so. <laughs> oh, man. Well, hey, listen, um, I jest. Uh, but whether you're taking it late, early, think about this. All over the world, we're taking it together with our family. And our family there in London and Switzerland and in Rome, in Guadalajara, everywhere. People are doing this very thing, and it connects us because of the Holy Spirit. So it's by the same Spirit that we gather together today and we take the Lord's Supper. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, with bread and cup, uh, we say thank you for everything that you've done. Father, thank you for the stories of how you've worked among your people in years past. And Father, I pray today that you would make us a people of courage, that you would help us to get on the ride, get on mission, to not be afraid, but to, to continue to live in the story of grace that began with Jesus, who we remember now. Father, when you breathe the breath of life into our lungs, um, you had a purpose for us. And so, Lord, now we ask that you give us the courage and the clarity and the wisdom and the resilience to live in that calling. So, Father, for my sisters and my brothers and for myself, uh, I pray that you would just continue the good work that you've begun in us for the last 10 years. And that, Father, for each individual in here, that the boldness of the, that the Holy Spirit provides would be prevalent in their hearts and lives so that we can say with complete conviction that the one who is in us is greater than the one who is in the world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.